All right. Um, so without further ado, um, we're going to get into our content for this meeting. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Clay Smith is a member of the principal professional staff at Johns Hopkins APL with over 35 years of experience analyzing systems um, from a risk, reliability, and safety perspective. Um, these systems have included uh, NASA and DOD missions, payloads, ground communication systems, air traffic control systems, and missile systems. Dr. Smith is a reliability engineering lead for APL's uh, space exploration. He created and managed NASA's International Space Station program probabilistic risk assessment, um, which he'll be discussing in a panel here in just a couple hours, which was specifically geared towards quantifying the safety risk during operations. He received his BS in uh, aerospace engineering and his master's in engineering management and PhD in reliability engineering um, from the University of Maryland. So I'm going to stop sharing and Clay, you may share your screen and Thank you for uh, joining us. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's get everything up here. There we go. Uh, well, thank you, Matt. I uh, appreciate this um, and welcome everybody. Uh, so Matt asked me a little while ago to give a reliability 101 discussion to start things. Uh, so I was like, okay, I'll try to squeeze 13 weeks of material down to 20 minutes. Sure, okay, got it. Uh, so in thinking about what is, is suitable to talk about, I just thought I'd, I'd just bring some points. Um, and so this kind of talk is, you know, maybe a little disjoint as I bring up different things. Uh, but hopefully it seeds conversation for the rest of the workshop for everybody. Uh, so what I thought we'd start with is the definition of reliability. Reliability is the probability that a product will perform its intended function for a specified period of time under specified environmental conditions. So you know, this is right out of textbook. I believe this is verbatim from the NASA documentation as well. Um, but it includes more than what we typically think about for reliability in that obviously it's a number, right? Between zero and one probability. Uh, yes, you need to talk about what success criteria is. You know, so what's the performance uh, criteria for when something is operational or not? Um, Time is the part of the specification. Um, this could be number of cycles. It could be uh, you know other things that that the the the, the, you know, the stress levels, for example. Um, but it also includes what are the environmental conditions. So for terrestrial applications, we tend to think of you know weather and, and things like that for power system. But uh, in space operations, then there's more to it, right? Obviously temperature, uh, but the temperature internal to the systems as well as what the environment is giving and what those swings are. So spacecraft going through eclipse, for example, gets you know wild cycles on, on temperature. Vibration, radiation, Dust in this case is going to be something to worry about as well, I would think. Um, so yeah, that this is again just the, the basic definition, but want to you know keep in mind that we're talking more than just what the number is. And of course, the graph uh, dictates what that reliability looks like when you have a distribution for the failure time or failures to cycle. Uh, so this jumps into the math of how things get uh, put together. But notice that this is a probability of time to failure. So this then starts to talk about, all right, how do I model the system? Where the physics involved that gets me to this time of failure? So obviously that is 
something that is part of this discussion. Availability is another term that is going to come up and different than reliability. So the reliability is the probability that the thing is working and the availability is the uptime over total time, essentially, right? The percentage of time that you're, you're up and operational. And this includes a number of aspects of what is considered proper downtime or, or, or the like. So maintenance, uh, time to upgrade software up, uploads, for example, on, on something where the system is not working while other things are happening. Some things are uh, may count against availability, some not. So preventive maintenance versus uh, fixing a problem can be handled differently. And DOD systems, you know, take this into account in terms of what the contractors are supposed to provide and then what is on the user base and both of those things make up this, this availability. I bring in this other discussion here on what the electric power industry looks at. So yes, they look at availability, but they cut it up in a couple of different ways. Uh, and this is to account for things where um, you have overcapacity or uh, undercapacity. These availability factor then starts to take into uh, account these various things. So you may have different parts of the system that are generating or have the capability to generate more power than the grid needs at any moment. And so there is a whole series of metrics and math behind how at least the US power industry uh, takes these into account. And I bring this up as part of the discussion of, you know, if you're creating requirements, then how to handle things that could be over capacity is part of the discussion. Certainly when you're talking about reliability or redundancy in capacity. Risk is more than a risk matrix, or the quantification is more than a risk matrix. I, mean, I see often where we we tend to put things on uh, uh, consequence versus severity, and essentially play a game of whack a mole to put things from red to green. And well, I think this works well for action items. Um, the reliability is more than chasing those things. And we, we typically, from a quantification point of view, want to look at the scenarios and how the system all responds and interacts together. So, you know, we ask questions about what can go wrong. How likely is it uh, to occur? What are the consequences associated when those things do go wrong? And then finally, how credible are those results? Right, that uh, that last part is um, needs to be taken into account. I'll talk about uncertainty in in a, in a slide or two. But, um, next point: um, go beyond just adding failure rates. So reliability at electric component level uh, in some corners is really just looking up failure rates and adding them, and now I have a failure rate for the system. Um, while it's convenient, it's easy to do, uh, it doesn't yield um, adequate results. Um, and often those results are just completely, completely different from uh, what measured reality, uh, re reliability really is. Uh, 2014, the uh, National Research Council uh, released a report, and in it, there was an appendix from a number of uh, reliability thought leaders basically critiquing the, the Mill Handbook 217 type of approach. So not specifically the, the document in itself, which is you know, from 1995, but just that whole methodology. Uh, and they point out a number of shortcomings that, you know, Constant failure rates is a good start, but it doesn't, it isn't reality uh, that constant failure rates are, are the exception, not the norm. 
things uh, have infant mortality, things have wear out mechanisms, and a proper understanding of the physics of what happens to the parts, to the system, to the interaction of those things is necessary. Um, this kind of approach doesn't really look at root cause or the failure modes. So just having a set of equations that come up with a number, you know, can ignore a lot of insights that the reliability community can bring to design. Um, the consideration of the environmental factors is done at best with fudge factors um, and not based on data from the specific environment. It's a, approximated uh, with no real tie to the physics. So, you know, that, that again needs to be poked at while the reliability analysis is being held together. Um, and then the final one is these, these databases and documents uh, that have the failure rates listed and even things from directly from manufacturers tend to be older uh, or used for different purposes. Uh, and so the, the failure rates that are used here uh, don't necessarily reflect the newest technologies. Uh, by definition, if it's already in a book, it's not what you are designing to do. So you know, just a word of caution for using this kind of approach. Again, it can be done uh, preliminarily, but the reliability analysis needs to be deeper and give more understanding to the system. I uh, suppose I'll talk a little bit about uncertainty. This is my advertisement to include uncertainty in all of the numbers that are provided. <clears throat> in the work we kind of do for estimating probabilities of engineered systems, the numbers are all estimates that this isn't taking power systems that we've already built on the moon and looking backwards and saying, okay, well, that's the probability that the system works. Right? These are estimates trying to forecast into the future. And as estimates, there, there's a lot of uncertainty that comes with it. Natural variability of part failure rates, so probabilities of, of success. Uh, but in addition to that, the technology maturity is, can be at different levels for different parts of the system. Uh, the designs and the, the, there is going to be a difference between as built and as designed. Uh, that design is an evolving process. Uh, and so you do have this mix of, of you know, the design um, throughout the system. Right. Some things have been designed and operating for a long time, and other things are new, perhaps even tech demo kind of things. So there's uncertainty associated with those. The system configuration can and often changes, which leads to you know, another source of uncertainty. The con ops um, may be different and evolving, certainly the the organization will learn as the systems operate and the learning means um, reacting differently. Uh, the con ops, like I said, may change how things happen on surface versus uh, what's happening on the ground and the interactions between them, all of those kinds of things. Uh, manufacturing processes uh, evolve over time. So the first things off the line may have a different reliability um, than things that have been produced in a number for many years. Uh, and then finally, requirements have some uncertainty associated. Oftentimes, we get requirements that are uh, lines in the sand, uh, but embedded in that is a factor of safety on 
that so the re, the line where the requirement is does not mean that if you pass that that the system will fail. So there is some uncertainty between where that system will fail, and unless the system has been tested to failure, you may not know what that that line is. Um, so the communication here with decision makers needs to account for all these assumptions and approximations. It, it's basically telling them how solid are the numbers. Um, the other thing that is part of this is that often decision makers value predictability more than a smaller probability of failure. So if something is, if you have a choice between a higher probability of failure, but it's very tight, I know that very well, versus a smaller probability of failure, but that may have a wide uncertainty on it, sometimes it's better to have that more predictable solution than not. And without understanding the uncertainties around that, then we take that decision away from the decision. Uh, physics of failure. So physics of failure is something that uh, is getting more and more popular and used in reliability assessments. Uh, NASA from the OSMA website states that physics of failure is um, an engineering-based approach to reliability that begins to understand materials, processes, physical interactions, degradation of failure mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so NASA itself is pushing to uh, go away from you know, just putting numbers down and calculating the failure rate to really understanding how the systems can fail and quantify that failure process. When does it happen? How does it happen? Under what conditions? What are the uncertainties driving those things? And as an example of how we have done that at the lab and supporting the uh, Glenn Research Center in their, their dynamic radio you know, power system. We're putting this kind of thing into, into use where, um, Here's a system that needs to work for 17 years um, without having flown. So how do you do that? Um, and so one of the things to do is understand how things will fail under these kinds of, of radiation and thermal environments. Uh, so we've set up models at for the different components where we look at fatigue and fracture mechanics and, and thermal aging, demagnification, if I could say the word, um, you know, and, and come up with those physics models for how those things degrade over time. Uh, and then using a Bayesian framework to say, okay, we have these models, they have uh, uh, constants associated with that. What can we test that will reduce the uncertainty around those models. Uh, some things we can uh, test uh, very well as components, and other things we need to run at the system level. At the system level, you don't stress the components very well. So there's a give and take in that. So one of the things we try to do with this is set up an optimization framework of how many hours, how many tests, under what conditions, and a mix of system level versus component level to try to you know, optimize the, uh, one, the requirement, the, the number that they're after, and two, what the uncertainty is around it. So there, there are also other endeavors going on uh, throughout NASA and in other parts of the industry uh, to do these kinds of things. Um, Common cause. So common cause failures are uh, one insidious and two happen a lot. 
Uh, and so these common cause failures are not the common cause failures of, I know exactly how these two systems relate to each other. And if this thing fails, I know this one is going to fail uh, because of a chain reaction, right? That's not the common cause we're talking about here. The common cause here is things that will reduce, that will defeat redundancy, but you don't know about a priori. The kinds of things that happen this way across all industries, including aerospace, is around 10% of the failure rate is due to these common cause problems. And these are things like uh, a lot issue uh, and components go into both sides of redundancy with the same lot issue. I've got a couple uh, examples down here, ESD, right? Technician goes in to fix one thing and ESD takes out something else. Uh, purchasing gets undersized motors. And so therefore all four redundant food fans go out, right? There are a couple of things. I'll, I'll note one that I was involved with. Early in my career, I was looking at uh, data analysis for diesel power generation. Uh, and we went out to this place that was you know, showing very poor reliability performance. And we walk into the place expecting it to just be you know, awful, uh, looking to go with the poor performance. But the place was immaculate. The, everything was painted. It was beautifully clean. You could eat off the floors. Maintenance didn't seem to be an issue here. It's like, what is going on? Well, it turns out that somewhere along the line and all their, their painting and making everything pristine looking, somebody painted over the grease beds. So for years, these diesel generators had not been maintained properly and nobody had removed the things. And so they were failing, right? From the outside, these painted grease beddings just looked like other bolts and nobody knew about them. So this was a common cause that affected all the diesel generators in the same in the same plant. There were four or six of them, something like that. So Clay, you're, you have five minutes. Okay, left. thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Explore scenarios, things that can cascade. So this particular example is uh, looking at uh, a failure scenario that happened um, several years ago. Uh, where some units tripped, uh, and that just caused the cascading problems of, of uh, bottlenecks and uh, of generators coming offline. This cascaded to a uh, huge portion of North America. Uh, other people probably know the, the ins and outs of this a little bit better, but understanding the failure scenarios beyond how your particular thing can fail. Um, one other thing I'll talk about here, the system will evolve and change. Uh, so we ran into this when we were putting together the, the early versions of the space station PRA that the while it had redundancy, it wasn't the same redundancy as the whole system. So you know, we had to account for that. Uh, and so initiators that would cause failures to say um, fans, where theoretically you had um, redundancy was dependent upon where in the life cycle and how the system was actually put together. So as the system evolved and grew, it basically grew into its redundancy. And so it wasn't always there. Had to get that and so my last slide, I'll just leave with uh, a, a vision of how all these reliability analysis can fit together and should fit together. So ultimately we want is some understanding of probability of success, right? And there are lots of different failure or reliability analysis that goes with that, right? So we have uh, FMEAs and Prometheus, we have fault management teams, we can build fault tree analysis and PRAs. All of this relies on data. And the idea here is that putting physics of failure modeling in the mix here to basically direct and inform where these uh, analysis should take place and how they all start to inter interrelate to each other.
So with that, I'll get off the stage. And with Matt, I guess we have a couple of minutes for questions. So. Yeah, thank you so much, Clay. Go ahead, anyone, if you have a question, use the Q&A tool. That's a little Q&A button with a little text bubble at the bottom of your screen if you have a question for Clay. Um, what I wanted to ask you, Clay, while we wait for if there's any other questions, is you know how do you continue to iterate and um, and and verify your model and assumptions after your system goes into operations? I wonder if you could speak to that. You know, based off pass out missions or ISS or anything like that. So taking data from the actual operating system and then feeding it back into your model. Yeah, so the, from the quantification point of view, uh, we have set up these analysis to uh, essentially for, for phasing updating. So as we get data, it updates the, uh, the distributions that we have at the basic event level and at the, uh, at the system level. Uh, so we can take the operational data hours of failure-free operation or even the number of failures that have occurred and put that in. Uh, the other thing to be aware of is changing failure modes. So humans do their best to understand and model the system, but the model is you know, only as good as the curiosity uh, of the humans that, that built it. So systems may fail in ways that we hadn't anticipated. So updating the model, the logic structure, Thank you so much, Clay. That was that was really really informative. I really appreciate you taking the time. If you have other questions for Clay, as some are starting to percolate in the Q and A now, um, Clay can go ahead and and type answers to that in in the Q and A chat. Um, and we unfortunately we are out of time. We got to move on to our next speaker. Um, so thank you very much, Clay, for taking the time. And and Clay will be on a panel later to speak more to his experiences with the uh, ISS PRA program.